I'd like to now consider material symmetry and its implications about the possibilities for the elastic moduli for linear elastic materials. So let me consider a material with a microstructure as drawn here. It's a little cube with uh, four little motifs. And let me consider a coordinate system one, two. So I'll, I'll do everything in two dimensions just to keep things simple. Now let me consider the experiment where I apply a strain in the one direction. And so this is the matrix of strain components in the one, two basis that I've set up. And I can go ahead and I can measure the stresses. So I measure the matrix of stress components again in the one, two basis. And for example, if I take the ratio of sigma one, one to epsilon, then that will be C one, one in this coordinate basis. So again, everything is in my original coordinate basis. We'll just call that E1, E2. Now let me uh, consider doing the exact same experiment, but with respect to a second coordinate system. So I'll call it one star, two star, and I'll apply a strain in the one direction in the one star, two star basis. And that will allow me to measure the stress components and now this time I'm going to measure them in the one star, two star basis. And I can compute C1111 now in the one star, two star basis. So this component here is in the one star, two star basis. And this is also in the one star, two star basis. So the C1111 here is in the star basis. Now in general, these two values of C11 are not going to be equal to each other. However, in particular cases, and for the case that I've drawn here, if the material microstructure po possesses a 90 degree rotational symmetry, then we actually should expect that the 1111 component computed from the original basis and from the star basis will be equal to each other. And th th this has implications on what the components can be. So for example, notice that uh, E1 star is equal to E2. So that means that C1111 in the star basis, this is actually equal to C2222 in my original basis. So what I end up with is that the 1111 component in my original basis is equal to the 2222 two, two component in my basis. So they're actually identical to each other. So these, this, is, this result here holds in the original basis. So if I, if I have a material that possesses this rotational invariance, then I'll have an interrelationship between the elastic components. Now, Rotation is one type of, of symmetry that we often see in materials. Another type of symmetry that we see in materials is reflective planes of symmetry. So I've drawn in here a microstructure with two motifs in it, and you can see that there's a reflective plane of symmetry right through the middle of this object here. So if I, if I reflect everything over that plane there, sometimes called a mirror plane, then the image will not change. Now. I can set up a coordinate system, a regular 1-2 coordinate system here. And I can set up a second coordinate system that's related to the first by reflection. So I've just reflected the, the 2 direction into the downward direction, and I'll call this 1 star, 2 star. If a material possesses this type of symmetry, in other words, a reflective plane of symmetry as I've drawn here, then, for example, if I go ahead and measure C1112 in the original basis, and I measure C1112 in my star basis, they should be equal to each other. Okay, And this again has implications on what values the elastic moduli can take. Um, just to kind of set this a little bit more formally, uh, material symmetry transformations or, or, or orthogonal transformations, uh, and they can be proper orthogonal, they can have determinant plus one, or they can be improper uh, orthogonal transformations, namely they have determinant minus one, sometimes also called uh, plus one would be called rotation sometimes, minus one improper rotations or reflections. 
Now, a material symmetry transformation is formally defined to be an orthogonal transformation, Q, such that if I define a optional basis, a star basis, in terms of my original basis, then components computed in my, in my optional basis are equal to components computed in my original basis. So that's the statement of material symmetry. If you have this relationship here, then this Q here is a material symmetry transformation. And j just note that the component, these QIJ are computed in the original basis. So that's the notation that we use. Uh, so this box relationship here is the requirement for material symmetry. And many materials have well-defined symmetry transformations, and they lead to reductions in the number of unique material moduli. And the number one way in which we can infer what the material symmetry transformations are for a material is to perform X-ray scattering. So when you perform X-ray scattering, you get dot patterns for the scattering pattern, and you can see various types of symmetries, rotational symmetries, reflective symmetries, and things like that. And those then tell you what the symmetry elements are for the material that you're looking at. And you can apply those uh, by imposing this requirement here. Once you've identified Q, you can impose this requirement. And that then allows you to infer things about what types of moduli you can have in your materials, how many of them can be non-zero, how many of them are equal to each other, and things like that. Note, without any material symmetry transformations, there are going to be 21 independent, unique elastic moduli. So that's the case where I have C, I, J, K, L. So I have minor and major symmetries. And major and minor symmetries combined together give me 21 constants. So we call that the triclinic case. And there are materials that are triclinic. But most materials have some type of material symmetry. And so we end up with fewer than 21 constants.